Hey there everyone, here we are with our physiology, the mechanics of ventilation. In this section, or this lecture, uh, video lecture section, what we're going to cover is definitely getting into more of the physiology aspect, obviously by the title, but also we'll still cover a little bit of new an, uh, anatomy and anatomical components as we go through this. Okay. So our first uh, anatomical component that we're going to dive into to help better understand how we actually breathe is the the anatomy I guess of of the plur pleural sac and so what that is is this double layered membrane that goes um, around each lung now there's uh, the visceral pleural or the visceral layer which is the outer part of the, the lungs so that's kind of like the surf this uh, wrapping or tissue or whatever uh, uh, going around the lungs, that's what the plural. Uh, you can call them the pulmonary plural as well, or plura. Um, it'll it'll uh, be the same thing. And then on the inner wall of the rib cage, if you will, the thoracic cavity, and um, it kind of encases around even the diaphragm, which is at the bottom of the rib cage. It's a muscle at the bottom there. Um, so again, kind of wraps the whole inside of the, the thoracic cavity, so your ribs. Um, yeah, what, what you'll end up seeing is another wrapping. And those two pleura uh, are essentially uh, um, held together through two, two components. And one is uh, um, like a lubricating fluid. And so something kind of interesting about fluids, and you might know this from water, is um, there's a bit of an uh, inherent property when you look at its atomic structure. So water, if you fill up a water glass really, really high, you'll see that water kind of crests out over top of the rim of the glass, right? Without actually spilling over if you just just a little bit in. That's called a meniscus. So like when, when you see that, what ends up happening is the water is holding itself together at like an anatomical level because of the attraction that the molecules have towards each other based off of something called hydrogen bonding. So in a similar fashion, we have a this fluid between the lining of the pleura and uh, it kind of helps adhe um, adhere them together through this, uh, this kind of fluid bonding capacity that it has. Um, the other component that helps keep these uh, two uh, sheaths together or pulls the sheath on the lungs out towards the thoracic cavity is a pressure difference. And so this intrapleural pressure um, just is a, a pressure difference between the two. So uh, you could, uh, it's a, well, it's, it's something called negative pressure. I wasn't sure if I wanted to explain that a bit, but uh, it's, there's some negative pressure pulling the pleura together. So that little space there, essentially what happens is um, you can just think of uh, negative pressure as the same thing as what draws fluid up in a straw, right? If you're having a soft drink with a straw, you create negative pressure in the straw and that pulls the fluid up. The same thing uh, also helps hold your pleura together. Okay. Now, when we're breathing, uh, there's something else that's going on with pressure. And that's actually the main component or the main drivers to how we breathe, okay? So when we... Um, uh, I guess the, to take a step back for a moment, the technical term for breathing is ventilation. So when we're ventilating, we're, we're actually breathing, okay? That we have uh, air coming into our lungs and out of our lungs, okay? So in order to inspire or breathe in during ventilation, one of the things we do is we increase the volume of our, of our intrathoracic cavity. So intra means in, Thoracic cavity is your, your rib cage. And the way we do that is, um, I, I'll kind of skip ahead and come back, is our diaphragm, okay? So as we breathe in, we have this like crush shape um, muscle, right? That kind of closes the bottom off the rib cage. And as we breathe in, what happens is it contracts. So the muscle tightens and it shortens. So this is its long position, that's its tightened position is flat and so as it flattens as you can just kind of imagine my rib cage as a closed system here 
as that gets drawn down, it increases the total volume of the lungs, okay? There are also muscles that do that, so inter, um, external intercostals. So there's a muscles like right between your ribs, you can actually feel them. The scalenes are muscles in your neck. We'll get an image of this later. Sternocleid mastoid is also at the front of the neck. And pec minor, which is a muscle that goes um, from the shoulder kind of collarbone area and attaches to the ribs, uh, usually at three attachment points, uh, mid chest below the pec major, which is your uh, chest muscles here. Okay. So again, with these uh, two kind of muscle groups working in conjunction and contracting, we have volume being uh, increased here at the bottom. That usually happens with passive or um, non-exercise inspiration. And then we have muscles that also elevate the, the top of the ribs to create more volume. And that typically happens as um, assisted inspiration when we're exercising. Now, when we decrease the volume of our inter, intrathoracic cavity, so that's the, when we decrease the volume in the space of our lungs, what that happens is the pressure pushes out air, and that's how we exhale. Okay, so air rushes out uh, when, when that a decrease of volume occurs. So, uh, yeah, it's a good way to imagine how we ventilate is, literally just um, changing the shape of volume of, of, of the container of our lungs. And that causes air to get drawn in and in, inspired and then pushed out to exhale. So how does that exhale or expiration occur? Well, we relax <laughs> actually. And so if we're not undergoing forced exhalation or expiration, um, our muscles essentially just relax. So again, if you can think of uh, the diaphragm can go being in a dome shape and in a relaxed state, that's less volume in our lungs. So again, it contracts, we inspire, it relaxes, um, and then we breathe out. So that intrathoracic uh, volume decreases. Okay, and that's all that happens. When we're exercising or we do like a conscious forced exhalation, what will happen is we got these three muscle groups that help. So internal, intercostal, so they're um, deeper to the, the external intercostals that we pointed out between um, our ribs. Our rectus abdominis, so those muscles are the uh, what we would commonly refer to as like our six pack muscles. So just they run up and down here at the front of our stomachs or our abdomens. And internal oblique muscles, those again similar are deeper. Um, we see external here, but internal are deeper to all three layers of our ab um, abdominal muscles, and they help with forced exhalation. So again, we wouldn't use these muscles typically unless we're exercising, and we need to force out more air, or uh, yeah, because that rest uh, is just the passive recoil. Uh, if you kind of vaguely remember, it's come up a few times where muscles have a bit of a, an inert or uh, innate characteristic where there's elasticity built into it. So again, if you uh, pull the band out, the elastic band out, it's going to want to recoil back to where it was. Okay, and so that's how we breathe out and just kind of in the process of all three uh, scenarios of how we ventilate. We have inspiration. Here's some illustrative uh, diagram of what I just uh, spoke about here. So we can see the diaphragm flattens out and increases the volume of your, your intrathoracic space. Therefore, air gets drawn in, that's inspiration. To breathe out, you can see the diaphragm relaxing and that decreases the total volume here. So air gets pushed out because there's less space for it. Um, and then at rest, it's just at rest. You can notice that, uh, yeah, it's just at that same, the diaphragm's at the same position as it was when it was exhaling because it's just relaxing. The, yeah, if you wanna take a look to uh, on your own uh, in your textbook here, you can just notice that um, where it mentions things like, I think it says accessory muscles. Yeah, accessory exhalatory muscles uh, contract. So again, your abdominals and your uh, internal 
intercostal muscles. Um, yeah, you can uh, make note of that too. But again, that's just primarily during exercise or forced ventilation. And as promised, a little anatomical diagram here of the muscles. So I've mentioned a few weird neck muscle names. If you, uh, if it helps to see them and to memorize them, we have our sternocleidomastoid, mastoid, sternocleidal mastoid, a bit of a mouthful, but we, we see it has the two heads here and then uh, goes up just kind of behind our ear where it attaches. Uh, and then the scalenes are these smaller ones kind of tucked in between. This larger one here is your trap trapezius, the top, top part, and we can kind of squeeze onto that on our neck uh, fairly readily and easily. It's a bit bulky there. Um, and the other nice thing here too is this diagram shows you muscles of inspiration versus ex expiration. Again, that's um, uh, forced or exercise-based accessory or helping kind of muscles that, that occur with respiration. Again, the primary one is the diaphragm, okay, and you can see that here. Okay, so as we go through normal mechanical ventilation, that's what will happen uh, as far as our anatomy is concerned and how the pleura work with each other to create that um, uh, increase and decrease of volume. But sometimes in our airways, we get resistance. So airflow resistance or airflow is the difference in pressure between atmospheric and within our lungs uh, over the resistance that's present. Okay. So, and yeah, so when we, I mean, we can think of um, a high, you can think of the weather almost with like a high pressure system and a low pressure system. Usually wind or air moves and wants to try to uh, balance itself out to make equilibrium and it's just easier to flow down that pressure gradient. The resistance itself to airflow can come up in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, one of the one of the main ways would be through some sort of uh, medical in either infection or chronic condition such as obstructive lung disease, <gasps> excuse me, or chronic obs uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, which you might have heard of as COPD. Uh, and what happens there is essentially the lining within the lungs become quite, um, let's just say gunked up. So there's, uh, you know, it, typically you'll see COPD in smokers. Uh, it's one of the uh, main causes of COPD. So the tar buildup and the smoke particulate and everything like that will start actually slowing down and resisting uh, the airflow into your lungs and that can cause a lot of a lot of issues um, yeah I guess on the opposite end so that was like a narrowing of the airways we can increase the diameter of the airways and that will increase airflow and so one of the ways we do that when we exercise is we you know start breathing through our mouth rather than our nose and that's one of the key indicators to show that our respiration rate and depth has increased. But you'll also um, have another thing that occurs when we start exercising, which is the sympathetic simulation of bronchodilation. Now, if you have asthma or no someone with asthma that takes a puffer, uh, through, through medicine we can cause bronchodilation. And again, that's increasing in the diameter of our bronchals or our um, uh, the the airways leading into in, in into our lungs um, yeah and that that's obviously going to make airflow have a lot less resistance so if you think of this equation again as I've shown in some of my other lectures where it's if this bottom number um, goes down this if there's no change between uh, a couple of different conditions like condition one and condition two so in condition one let's say the pressure difference is uh, 50 millimeters of mercury. Um, and you can, you'd recognize that unit from when you're doing blood pressure, right? So we'll say, say that was a pressure difference. But the resistance in the first condition is obstructed. So it's quite high, let's say uh, 100. And then in the other one, it's quite low because we have basal, bron uh, sorry, bronchodilation and no obstruction. So let's say it's one. The, the smaller number on the bottom means a larger airflow here, right? Because this number, the fraction that these two numbers make will make that, that number larger, okay? 
Okay. Um, right. Airflow. Good. Okay. So we covered everything there. Okay. So next up we have our pulmonary ventilation. Uh, really what we're talking about at this point. Uh, so we've already spoken about, let's just go over a quick review. So how do we uh, inhale and exhale? We know that from pressure changes. We know we have these accessory muscles that help out with that. And we know aside from the mechanical aspects, um, as far as our musculature and creating or uh, increasing or decreasing our intrathoracic space, that can, uh, our airflow into our alveoli can also be changed by how much uh, uh, blockage or the diameter of our, our airways is a huge, huge component of that, as is the pressure difference between atmospheric and the pressure in our lungs, right? Um, okay, so when we take a consideration of our total amount of oxygen that we, we can move in and out of our lungs for any given minute, that's when we start getting into the realm of what's called... Um, it's essentially our, our volume of expired air or VE number. So when we're considering that, we want to look at our tidal volume. So that's the amount of air moved uh, per breath that we take. And then you just multiply that by the frequency of breaths that you have in one minute. And if you think about this, this should sound very, very similar to something that we did last chapter where we uh, were talking about cardiac output. Right? So we have the total volume of something, in this case, um, tidal air, uh, multiplied by the frequency. When we're talking about cardiac output, it was stroke volume and heart rate, which is, was our frequency. Okay? What we tend to find is that the volume of expired air per minute is much greater in trained athletes, in particular endurance trained athletes, and that's both... Um, just kind of like uh, generally speaking, but like in particular, we notice it most during maximal exercise because they can obtain a greater absolute value for the volume of expired air. Okay. Um, yeah. And so there's different components of uh, ventilation based off where in a breathing cycle that we assess. There's a really good graph in, uh, that we'll analyze for this because there's parts of our, our ventilation that don't ever really leave our lungs or don't ever really get to the alveoli. And we'll talk about what those look like. But one of the terms, um, anatomical dead space, so that's air in our respiratory system that never really reaches the alveoli. So it's kind of in this like middle ground that kind of gets pushed and pulled a bit. Uh, we'll take a look at what that might look like. Um, when we get to our graph, an alveolar ventilation. So that's air that we actually get to breathe in and makes it all the way to our alveoli for, for full ventilation, okay? When we look at these greater trained athletes, we notice that the upper parts of the lungs get utilized more by them. So again, when we just have this regular um, tidal breathing you know, in, in a bit of a relaxed or restful state, we only use a portion of our lungs, and, and typically it's the apical or uh, top part of the lungs that really don't get much use. And uh, that's where we see a lot of anatomical dead space. But when we increase our, our ventilatory capacities, we start using more and more of that dead space. Okay. Uh, so this is a good illustration of a couple of points I was making. So this is our um, pulmonary, pulmonary ventilation at different moments. So at rest, exercise, mild, moderate, and maximal, and then for endurance athletes. But I think what's also important to look at here is our frequency per minute of breath for all these states. And yeah, so we'll see uh, frequency again is around 12 at rest. You can you can take note of this too, just like you would when you took um, your resting heart rates. You can do a very similar thing, you know, relax for three to five minutes uh, and then hit the start a timer and just count the breaths or have someone count your breaths. Sometimes when you're counting, you increase your respiratory rate. Uh, but this is really, really useful if you're in a medical setting. Um, yeah, if, if someone's under some sort of respiratory distress or 
um, having uh, problems circulating um, enough oxygen to their tissues and uh, there's some sort of uh, pulmonary influence involved you very quickly start seeing um, you know moderate exercise levels or respiratory rates even though the person might be laying down in bed so uh, yeah so again I, and what's interesting here too I think is both to see what the maximal end of this is it's always interesting to see what top end hu humans with elite training can do and so frequency per minute they can get up to almost 60 so if you think about that how that breaks down per minute that's almost a breath per minute it's a pretty high breathing rate and again if you look at the maximal exchange um, uh, pulmonary ventilation volume in this in liters per minute that's almost uh, well it's 183 so almost getting close to 200 liters of um, air exchanged per per minute that's pretty impressive stuff okay now some of the things that will happen when we um, start exercising is we'll notice that the frequency and depth of our breathing changes and there's a particular order for that so again it's you'll notice your depth of breathing increases and then the frequency and if we kind of go back i just want to touch on this over here um again we'll notice like there's not a too large of a change you know i would i would probably argue when we're at rest to mild or maybe even moderate exercise, pretty small jump there as far as frequency. But we do notice a, f um, you know, a fairly uh, relatively large increase in, in our uh, ventilatory, uh, uh, our pulmonary ventilation. Sorry, that was tough to get out. Um, relative to the, the, the increase in frequency as we get up to heavy and maximal exercise relative to the ventilatory exchange, these numbers start uh, not jumping up quite as much and these continue to increase. So uh, again, it starts with um, depth of in, uh, breathing and then um, rate of breathing. Okay, but we'll, we'll take a little peek now and there's a good graph that helps illustrate this. Um, we look at different lung capacities and volumes here in different aspects and different types of breathing, and that helps us understand lung functioning. So you can go in for something called a spirometry test, and it's on one of these machines. So your nose is plugged, so you can't breathe through that. It's not uh, an uncomfortable nose plug per se, it's just kind of a little foam, and you uh, are instructed to breathe in different manners. So sometimes it's a big depth breath in, huge breath out, sometimes it's relaxed breath in, big breath out, but generally there's something to do with forced breathing. And one of the ideas is we're trying to see how much reserve tidal volume you have. We try to see how much um, total volume of air you can expire in one, four, in one second, sometimes six seconds. And uh, again, this gives us uh, a really good idea as to how our lungs function. One thing to note is our residual volume is the amount of air left in the lungs after a maximal exhalation. Now I want you to pause here for a second. Just think, why would that, why would that be a thing? Like, how can we still have air in our lungs at maximal ventilation? Well, we need that air and that pressure from the air in our lungs. Otherwise, it would collapse, right? If all the air in our lungs were completely exhaled every time we breathed out, the little alve alveolar bubbles would collapse and because they have fluid on the inside it'd be hard to reopen we need a lot greater negative pressure between the pleura to be able to pull everything back open every time we took a breath so it's a really good thing that we actually have this residual air or uh, residual volume as it's called here okay so we'll just take a brief look here again this is a graph that i kept alluding to throughout this lecture so far so we see on the y axis we have total volume and then as we go along we have we can see that these are different lung volumes or names for lung volumes that we have spirogram we'll uh, talk about what this indicates but this is our readings as far as how much um, volume of air that we're moving 
And then lung capacities are just the different names we give for each uh, collective segments of breath that we look at. Okay, so inspir inspiratory reserve volume, that's when we, uh, oh, sorry, let's start at tidal volume, sorry. So tidal volume is what you've been doing this whole time. So just breathing in, breathing out in a relaxed, rested state, uh, just as you naturally would. But then when you force an inhale, that's when we get into our inspiratory reserve volume. So force that inhale as deep as you can. That will be the maximum amount, and that's around um, five, five and a half liters. And exhale as hard as you can. Um, it's gonna drop all the way down to here. So that's our reserve expiratory volume. So that's just outside the tidal volume down to our max exhalatory volume. Back to tidal breathing here. Forced inhale, back to tidal breathing there. Forced uh, exhale, so expiratory reserve volume and so forth, okay? Um, when we consider what the, well, I guess it's really what the um, total volume is minus uh, whatever the expiratory reserve volume is, that gives us our residual volume. So this is um, essentially our anatomical dead space. This is uh, parts of air that doesn't get exchanged uh, with um, the outside world, it's just within our lungs. Okay, and obviously as we mix air, some of it does make its way out, but we always have some volume of air within our lungs. Uh, and so we call that with our expiratory reserve volume, our functional residual capacity, uh, which uh, yeah sits from uh, just the bottom of our title into the, the uh, zero mark of, of volume in our lungs. Our vital capacity is one of the more commonly used and looked at. So if we consider what the vital capacity uses, this right here, it looks at our forced inspiration and our forced exhalation. So if you think about that in an exercising sense, that's what we're really using. So our vital capacity is a really good indication of what we can maximally functionally use when we're exercising or just going about our days, um, maybe climbing a really big hill or uh, while carrying lots of heavy groceries, right? That's that would probably tap in a little bit to our vital capacity, okay? And obviously from our tidal volume to uh, the top of our inspiratory reserve volume is our inspiratory uh, capacity. If we consider it all from zero, so our residual volume, all the way up to the tip top of our inspiratory reserve volume, that is our total lung capacity. But just remember our total lung capacity um, isn't actually the total, uh, it includes air that isn't actively exchanged as well, right? It includes that residual volume. Okay, great. So we covered uh, a lot there. Hopefully you took something away from that. Feel free to go back, study again, review again, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of good stuff here as far as our, again, mechanical uh, capacity of how to breathe and what causes that breath to occur how the structure of our inspiration and expiration occurs. We got some accessory muscle groups to help out. What may or may not allow air to flow, so resistance and pressure differences. Um, some metrics that we look at when we're trying to consider uh, a capacity of our lungs, so pulmonary ventilation as a whole, uh, as well as um, what may or what increases first while we're exercising and we're trying to recruit more breath and deeper ventilation. And we got a way where we can measure and analyze different components of our breathing, or sorry, of our ventilation. Uh, in particular, uh, different components of our inspiration, expiration, and tidal volume, or residual volume, and how that all goes together, and how we can look at that to assess for function. Okay. Thanks for watching.